Now, just in case you've just come to UCU, I still hope I know what goes on here. This is mission is and ministry conference. The, the September semester, there is an evangelistic mission, which is basically drawing people to Jesus, helping them to have a relationship with Jesus. This one, yes, we can draw people to Christ, but it's not the major thing. The mission is an ministry conference is about challenging ourselves. It's about challenging those who are believers to get involved in God's mission. Hallelujah. To reach out to people like this Russian I've just talked about. I've been told that Dr. TV yesterday shared with you about the main theme of our role in reaching people in diaspora. That God has brought people, God has always moved the people, and he has always moved the people for a purpose. And he shared with you that it is not that we are always going to go where the people are. By God moving people, he has actually now moved the people where we are. In other words, you can be a missionary where you are because the people you would go to look for to evangelize like that Russian man, I don't have to go to Russia to reach him for Christ. God somehow has moved him to Uganda and has moved him to Kampala where many of us, the Christians, are. The mission is an ministry conference is a challenge to us that in your own profession, God is calling you to reach others for Christ. Yes, you are a teacher, you are a lawyer, you are whatever you are. God is calling you to do that. The mission is an ministry conference is a challenge for us to utilize every opportunity to bring God's kingdom to people. But it is also a time when we are really challenging people to say, my friend, maybe God is calling you not only in that profession, but maybe turning this other side of being a priest, a priest or a pastor or an evangelist. Your vice chancellor who has come in here, I think his PhD is, is in statistics. I wondered when I first met him in African Evangelistic Enterprise, what is this man with statistics doing in AEE? But God has called him into this area to do ministry in this other way. And that is what this is about. Now, this morning we are looking at a topic, misunderstanding the messenger of God. Misunderstanding the herald of God. John chapter 7, verse 25 to 35 is the focus. The passage of John chapter 7 uh, from verse 1 is an area where people don't clearly get to know who Jesus is. There are many various groups in this passage, and each of the group is wondering who this Jesus is. The first group, we didn't read about it. It is in the first verses from verse 3 to verse 5. It is his family. Verse 3 says that Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave Galilee and go to Judea, so that your disciples there may see the works you do. Verse 4. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. Verse 5. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. What is happening in those first verses in that particular group? The brothers think that Jesus is just a public figure. They think that Jesus is a popularist. He is a person who should go and do his miracles, and people see his miracles, and people praise him. That may be the first thing you think about. 
However, if you think deeply that they actually didn't believe in him, although Jesus is avoiding going to Judea, because first one, verse 1 says the Jews were waiting to kill him, these people, the brothers, are thinking this Jesus needs to be exposed. The brothers are saying to him, you must not miss this great opportunity there. You will be, there will be a great crowd because there is the feast of the, the tabernacle. The people will see the miracles. The people will praise you. The people will honor you. Now that on the surface seems to be what they are saying. But I also think that since they don't believe he's actually what he says he is, they want to drive him to Jerusalem, that he will be scrutinized. They are saying you've been trying to deceive the Galileans, you've been trying to pretend to be important, you go and meet these guys in Jerusalem, and they will check you, and they will see what you are, and they will tell others what you really are. So they actually do not know Jesus really. They think he's a fake Bible teacher. Maybe they even don't believe he really makes these miracles. So that's the first group there. They are misunderstanding him. The second group is what John calls the Jews. He refers to them as Jews in verse 1, in verse 11, in verse 13, in verse 15, and in verse 35. This is a group of the Jewish religious leaders who John also identifies as the Pharisees, the chief priests, and they also were included in that. They belonged to the Sadducees, according to verse 34. These people think Jesus is an ignorant person because they are saying he's not educated. That's what it says actually in verse 12, verse 15. Verse 15 says that they are looking at him, at his teaching, at what he's saying, and they are wondering. Look at what he says in verse 15. It says, uh, let, me read, let me read from verse 12. And there was complaining among the people concerning him. Some said he's good, others said no, on the contrary, he deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly about him for fear of the Jews, verse 14. Now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up and the, went into the temple and he told, verse 15. And the Jews marveled, saying, how does this man know the letters having never studied? There's a confusion there. They think he's an ignorant man, he didn't study, and yet at the same time, the way he's teaching, he's very, very authoritative. That group also doesn't actually understand him. There is another group in this, in this area. These people are the people you would call the crowd. These people think that he is a deceiver. That's what they say, again, as I've read in, in, in verse 12. There's a discussion before that, and they are really trying to say, is this really the Son of God? Is this the Messiah? Is this the Christ? Or we are mistaken. He is actually not the person who we think he is. But then they also are believing him because of the miracles he's doing. That's another group there. There is another group John calls the people of Jerusalem. And there is a discussion with those people in verses 25 and 27. They were again confused whether it's the Messiah or not. Because somehow in their thinking, they are thinking the Messiah will come they will not know who he is. And they are thinking, this one we know. We know him. We know his parents. We know everything about him. Now, how is this connected to the 
thing we are looking at about being missionaries. I've just looked through it, and this is the major thing I want to deal with in the remaining few minutes. First of all, I want to make the point clear that knowing who Jesus is, is the basis for mission. Praise the Lord. Until we really understand who Jesus is, until we are convinced about Jesus' identity, until we know that that relationship with Jesus is the source of the destiny, is the message, is the gospel itself, we have no message to share with the people. There is a lot of confusion and misunderstanding about Jesus. And the people who are to take the message of Jesus to the rest of those who do not know him must be conversant about who Jesus was. That's why Jesus himself asks his disciples, who do people say I am? Because knowing who Jesus is is very central. And it's amazing that because Jesus knows that that's the central thing, after they have said all the various answers, he turns to the, them and says, who do you say I am? We cannot talk about you getting involved in mission. We cannot talk about you going to the diaspora and proclaiming the message if you are not convinced about who Jesus is. Jesus himself knew himself, of course, being God and knowing the people and knowing what is going through the people. In this passage, he's trying over and over again to tell the people who he is. Because that is the basic thing, knowing who he is, knowing his testimony, knowing his ministry. That is what is going to compare us. That's what is going to give us the conviction that we have the message. Now, we live at a time where people think there are many ways. Now, just imagine if that is what you think. And I hear even other people. I went to a funeral service last week, and the preacher came and he was saying, I know all of you are here, I know there are Muslims here, I know there are those who are Catholics, but you know I don't care because all roads lead to heaven. It doesn't so much matter as long as you keep in line with what is taught. I wasn't sure whether he really was remembering that he had said, even Muslims. But, but maybe he really knew that, but he was trying to please the people. Maybe he didn't have a stronger conviction that salvation is only in the name of Jesus. There is no other name through which people can be saved except the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And now, as simple as that sounds, that is very crucial. Because if you don't have that conviction, you will not have the zeal to preach to Muslims. You will not have the zeal to preach to Hindus. You will not have the zeal to seek for those other people because the conviction about who Jesus is is not clear with you. Jesus makes clear in that passage that is correcting people every now and then. Let me give you an example. He says to these guys, when they are saying to him, look at verse 25. Now some of them from Jerusalem said, is this not he whom they seek to kill? But look, he speaks boldly, and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? However, we know where this man is from. But when the Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. Then Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple, saying, You both know me, and you know where I am from. And I have not come of myself but he who sent me is true. 
whom you do not know, but I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. He's making the point. I am not the one you know. I am sent by a higher authority. Hallelujah. I am from him. I am not an ordinary person. Again, relate this to being missionaries. If you will go to people and you do not feel convinced that you are sent by God, then you are in trouble. Because there are going to be issues, there are going to be challenges, there are going to be misunderstanding, there are going to be things that move you. Jesus is not moved. He knows these people are seeking to kill him. But his identity is clear. He knows he's not ordinary. He knows he's sent by the Father. So why do we need to know that these misunderstandings prevail? Number one is because our conviction in who Jesus is will propel us to share Jesus to the people. If we believe Jesus has made a difference in our life, that will be the crucial thing to compel us to share. Jesus makes that clear over and over again. But secondly, why do we want to think about this misunderstanding here? Because when we realize that people can misunderstand us, we will not be discouraged when we are misunderstood. Hallelujah. Now, when you are going to share, there are many people who fear to share the message because they fear to be misunderstood. If I go to these people and tell them about Jesus, they may think I'm a madman. Do you know there are people who don't preach because of that? They fear to be misunderstood. How can you sit in a plane, you are an executive guy, and you are talking about Jesus to this, the person will misunderstand you. We want to see and to learn that Jesus himself was misunderstood. He did not give away, he did not give up to his mission for fear of being misunderstood. We cannot control people misunderstanding us. They will misunderstand our motives, they will misunderstand the things we said, they will misunderstand, they will do that. But Jesus, although he is misunderstood by the different groups here, he is still focused to the purpose. Praise the Lord. This week, maybe God may be calling you to join the ministry. And the whole, whole thing that may fail you to respond is the fear that what will people think? The whole, whole me, a lawyer going to become a reverend, the fear of being misunderstood. Why? Because the people have misconception. I worked with a bishop who had four degrees, and he had a PhD in botany. And one time he gave me uh, a letter to take to, to UNEB. And when I took the letter there, the big man in your neighbor at the time looked at the letter and he said, this man has four degrees, including one in botany, and he's just a bishop? I can't believe this. Do you hear that? He's just a, a bishop. What is that saying? The misconception is a person who is as learned as that should do not be a bishop. So maybe the misunderstanding of the heralds may be a problem, may be an obstacle to response. Thank God they have many examples here, and there are even people who are here. There was a professor here, he was called Edison Moyindo. His first degree was veterinary. From a veterinary, he moved on, he came to church, he did the theology, and uh, he's no longer treating animals, he treats the souls, hallelujah. But you know, it would be hard, it would have perhaps been hard for him to think that he can move 
from that calling to this calling. I'm not saying necessarily that this is a better calling, this is more important, but I'm saying God may call you. Listen to what it says in verse 29 in that reading. From verse 30. Therefore they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour has not, has not yet come. And many of the people believed in him and said, When the Christ comes, will he do more signs than this which this man has done? Two things there. First of all, the people will fear sometimes to come to be heralds because they think they are not safe, they are not secure. Both people who want to go to be missionaries, they are always thinking it's not safe. And the truth is, it might be challenging. But the Bible here says clearly that Jesus had the protection. When God calls you, when God sends you, God will also give you the protection. They wanted to lay from the first verse, it says they were trying, they were looking for opportunities to kill him. The Bible says they were not able to lay their hand on, them, on him. And the Bible says because his time had not come. And so sometimes the fears we have about safety may not be also fears that may hinder us from coming to him. It's amazing that even within that confusion, people were still coming to the Lord. People were still receiving him and believing him, even amidst the confusion that was taking place. So we need not to be scared of being misunderstood. If God calls us, we should be willing. We shouldn't be Fearful because people will think we are ignorant because they think that is an area for ignorant people, which actually is not true. But thirdly, Jesus' experience of this being misunderstood in this passage also teaches us about dealing with the situation is when we are misunderstood. There will be misunderstanding when we face people with the gospel. First of all, there will be people who think we are being too much on them. Listen to this Russian friend of mine. He said, the good thing I want, I love about this family is that they don't push me so much to be a Christian. Do you hear that? They don't push me so much to be a Christian. But remember my first part of the story. He's already thinking there is good in being a Christian. But the Christians are not doing much because they fear to be misunderstood. So they are trying to be good people to this person. Standing for Christ is risky, is challenging, and yet vital. Unless the Christian is stand for Christ and live a life of Christian witness, we will not make a difference in the world. Live a Christian life such that people can recognize the difference. There is a scholar, I don't know who he is, and he says, walk with a Christ-like life and preach only when it is necessary. Do you know what that means? If you just lived your life as a Christian, you are already preaching. And another person adds on that, be careful the way you live as a Christian because you might be the only Bible the non-Christians are reading. My Russian friend, he doesn't know this Bible. He actually said, I don't know what exactly is in that book, but I know it makes people good. But he also adds to it, he's learning from the life of his wife. 
And so we are saying, the call is that when you are a Christian and you go into an organization and you go to serve in every way God has called you, whether a social worker, whether a teacher, whether whatever you are, you are to be there and live a life of Christian witness. The call is for you to use that platform as a Christian to reach others for Christ. Now, people, when again we are thinking about missionaries, we still think about going very far. Let me tell you, there are places even within, as Dr. TV said yesterday, when I was still serving here, I had the opportunity to go to Karamoja. And I call it an opportunity because my eyes were open in many ways. First of all, I had students to supervise in Soroti. And in my own mindset, I was thinking, I will supervise students in Soroti, I will spend a night there, and then later on in the day, I will proceed to Moroto. I went to the tax park and they told me, actually, there are no taxis going to Moroto at that time. I don't know if it has changed. I was shocked about that. Because I thought in Uganda you can get taxis everywhere, anytime, to go to any place. So I had to stay in Soroti again. So I moved the next day and I moved and I reached Moroto. I spent a night there and woke up and went to buy a newspaper. And they gave me a newspaper for yesterday. And I said, I want the one for today. They said the one for today will come tomorrow. <laughs> and, and so, you see, and then the more I interacted with the people and the students and everything, the more I realized how much work there is even in a place like Karamoja. Maybe God is challenging you that after you graduate, you go and spend a year or two in Karamoja. We have somebody who has been there four years. He has just come back. It's a totally different type of life there. There is opportunity for making impact for Jesus, but also in ordinary life. And so you can do that. This week is a challenge to you. Can you think about giving back to God? Utilizing your gifts, utilizing your talents, utilizing your time for the extension of the kingdom. There are schools there in Karamoja, but sometimes the teachers have to follow the students where they are. It's a different life. But you may say, well, after I have just graduated, people will think I'm stupid. How can you waste your degree and go there? They will misunderstand me. They misunderstood Jesus. He continued and he did the right thing. The one we are focusing on this whole week, we are going to be focusing on again Paul more and more and his impact for the gospel. How he risked his life. How he was willing to put aside a few things in order to be able to go and witness for Christ. We may not need to be defensive when we are misunderstood. Let God defend us. Hallelujah. When I was a student, no, when I was a staff here, I was at one stage misunderstood. There were many Banyankole girls at my place. And some people were wondering, why would the Banyankole girls be at the Musogaz home when there are many Banyankoles here? Let me tell you, it didn't change me. Because I was convinced that I was a ministry to do 
And plus, those girls knew there were Nyankoli men around here and women. They had come to me. Hallelujah. It was possible for me. Actually, there was a brother who came to me and shared with me. And he was doing so genuinely. He said, the people are murmuring. These Banyankole girls around you is a problem. There is actually another Munyankole girl, Moses' daughter. She's at my place even as I speak now. The point I'm making here, I'm not just saying a story. We should be willing to cross boundaries for the sake of Jesus. We should be willing to let go the understanding of the people, the misconception of the people, to be able to reach others for Christ. One time, so many years ago, in the newspaper, there was a picture of Bishop Misairi Kauma, the late Bishop Misairi Kauma. He was in a place called Chisenyi in Kampala. And he was sitting with the people around a Malua pot. Malua is a local brewed drink, alcohol. And he was there. He was actually holding one of those things which he had, you know, the calabash thing. Bishop Kauma was a born-again Christian, a leader. Bishop Kauma was not actually drinking, but by Bishop Kauma going to Kisenya and sitting with those people, that alone was a gospel to those people. Now, I don't know whether people got saved or not. I, I have no details. But the point is, he was willing to go and be with the people for the sake of the gospel. Would some people misunderstand him? Of course, yes. Was it important for him to take the risk? It was. Let me give you a final bit. Bishop Zach Niringi, and I think I've said this before. He collects all of us, the clergy in Kampala, and takes us to a place called the Kalerwe. And in Kalerwe, there is a project that reaches prostitutes. And he brings one of those ladies, and provocative as Bishop Zaka can be, he puts his arm around that lady. And he says to, see, to us, this lady you see here was a prostitute. And I heard the person next to me say, ha. Ah. And the next thing I heard was, how can the bishop put his arm around her? Remember, the bishop was saying she was a prostitute. That lady had turned to Christ. That lady was undergoing discipleship with a group of others. But even if she was still to be a prostitute, we can never be missionaries until we have the love for God, the love for the brethren, and the love for sinners. But when we have those three, the real love and the understanding of who Jesus is and the love for God is clear to us. And the love for the brethren is deep within us. And the love for sinners, we will be ready to go to the diaspora and to proclaim Jesus and bring many to him. When I was chaplain here, we used it to keep time. I don't want people to think that I'm now a villager. <laughs> May the Lord bless you as you focus on the call to missions and to ministry. Amen.